okay whenever you're ready. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Welcome to Wales. <laughs> I'm here to introduce. <laughs> Ah. Start, ag <laughs> start again in a second. Do we, do we need to stop? <laughs>
again, more bits of graptolite, still nothing exciting. And sometimes you just don't get anything at all in the layer that you've uh, picked out, which of course is inevitable when there's a camera on it. Ah, hang up. There's something black here. It's about a millimetre or so. Yeah, that is the right preservation. There's something small and black and partly embedded. So it's going to need a microscope to be able to tell what on earth we're looking at and whether it's interesting. So I'll just put that to one side for the moment and carry on going in case there's something better. Aha! More black things. After a while you just get used to what the right preservation looks like and you can immediately spot something that's part of a soft-bodied fossil. Uh, this is sponges. Got little bits of sponge in here. Um, yeah, may not be anything too exciting, but it's there. And they've got the bits of the spicules that make up the skeleton. You probably can't see anything uh, from that distance, I guess. But, um, but there are little bits of sponge in here. Let's see. Most rocks you would uh, not really break down very far at all. But with here, because the fossils are so tiny, you have to actually keep carrying, going on until you've got, you really can't split it any further. So here we're down to flakes about three or four millimetres thick, but we haven't stopped yet. <sighs> Nothing in that one. Health's being really short-sighted. Ah, there we go. There's one of these tiny little tubes. So it's something organic. It's, um, well, we know what this is because it's one of the most common things here. Um, but it's a, a tiny little tube which has not been described yet. Uh, so something completely organic, about a millimetre and a half long in that case. So it's worth having a little look at that. I don't think there's any soft tissue in it, but still. When you get a nice big surface like this, it's always quite exciting, and then normally there's nothing on it at all. Once again, there are some tiny little black flecks on here. Is it exciting not knowing what the black flecks are? Kind of exciting, yeah, because sometimes um, you can have a fairly good idea of what you found in the field, and, and it just the microscope confirms it, but other times We've actually found some of the best fossils have been ones that we haven't even really recognised in the field. We've just taken back a little tiny flake of carbon, thinking it might be nothing, and it turns out to be an arthropod with legs and little spiky bits sticking out and so on. So, um, it, just the, the scale of this is quite hard to work with in the field. It's, this is only the first stage. Um, yep, more sponge spicules. They get everywhere. So, as a sponge expert, mm. what can they tell us? Like, what kind of environments did they live in? What kind of animals are they? Yeah, sponges are actually very, very abundant um, in relatively uh, quiet conditions. So, offshore environments, in the deep ocean especially, they dominate in a lot of seafloor areas. So, in terms of ecology, it doesn't tell you that much because they're everywhere. But what they can tell you is a lot about their evolution because they're a very understudied group. And some of the sponges that are turning up here are very modern. They're much more advanced than we'd expect them to be at this time. And so it's, it's really quite uh, peculiar. And they, they tend to be the rare ones. The common ones are the ones you'd expect. And then you get occasional examples of things which are much more unexpected. Um, but you get little fragments of the sponges all over the place, just the spicules. But the thing is, the silica is dissolved, like all of the, uh, the minerals that make up the skeletons of these things. The calcite, the phosphate, all of it is dissolved. And the only thing you're left preserved is the organic material. So we're dealing with just one group of sponges in particular for these isolated spicules that have organic layers in the spicules, which is not common today. <laughs> so it's a very odd... Um, type of preservation. And there are some layers where we can get 
the silica preserved in sort of silicified layers a bit further up. And there you find the spicules are everywhere. So almost all of them are gone and we're just getting either the organic ones or the ones with the soft tissue, the actual body fossils. So I'm still seeing just tiny little flakes in here. You have to scour every single surface to see what you can find, if anything. But um, yeah, it takes a little while to find the good stuff. How often do you make finds? Is it like one every hour? Is it one every day? It's really varied, but we always find something good. And once you get to the right layers, then every time you split it, there'll be something soft body in it. But um, it might be, you know, an hour or two or three before you actually get one of these beds, which is particularly prolific. Most of them, you, you just get um, the odd fragment here and there. Now, this one has several brachiopods in. It's got exactly the right sort of preservation. I can see silvery bits. I can see little black bits appearing now. It's starting to oxidise a little bit. Yeah, this is a sort of layer that we would take back and put under the microscope because you probably miss things in the field. But there are definitely little brachiopods and yeah, that's one for the microscope, I think. I'm excited. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> We've been stuck in uh, stuck indoors all winter because you can't work until it gets uh, until it warms up and the sun comes out. And so we're hoping for something really good this year. Oh, what we got there? Uh, grab flies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's just the common one, unfortunately. There are lots of more exciting grab lights as well. Actually, I say that. Is it? Oh, here's a Discovery Live. Oh. Unfortunately, my hand lens is steamed up. <laughs> oh, I think that's something a bit different. It's got little fibrous things in it. It might. Yeah, I think that is something different. That's one for Lucy. Where is she? There you go. Come and have a look at that one. I'll carry on hammering. <laughs> I'm going through this actually probably quicker than we would when we we're out here working. It would take a long time to go through very much material at all. And of course, with most fossil sites, you just wouldn't bother splitting things this size. But this is often where the best bits are here. It's not the best spectator sport. <laughs> and you, you never know what is going to turn up with the very next block that you hit. But on the other, other hand, usually it's nothing. That's, that's the addicting part. Can you leave it at the end of the day? Uh, it's quite hard, actually. When we start getting hungry, then um, it's normally a, a safe bet when it's time to go. But... But no, it's, it's very hard to drag us away from some of these quarries. Um, lots more brachiopods. There's this one tiny little brachiopod, just a couple of millimetres, a little round thing, which, um, yeah, it, it, it's quite an interesting one because it was partly pseudoplanktic. So it was partly living attached to graptolites. Whoa! Uh, floating around in the surface. We know this from one other site where we've actually got them still attached to the graptolites. Um, and partly just living on the sea floor, but it's hugely abundant. And in fact, in the built-in layer, if we find a site without this uh, micula, a Patabolus micula, we get quite excited because it means something weird was going on. <laughs> but there are lots of... Oh, there is something here. Still partly embedded as it usually is, but that's another thing to look for. Look, look at under the microscope. It's got the right sort of browny, carbonaceous preservation. Might not be anything exciting, but we'll find out with the microscope. Right, so I've been asked to talk a bit about graptolites while hammering, so I, I will do that. Um, graptolites are one of the most common fossils here, which is really handy because they are very, very good for dating rocks. Ooh, I've got half a trilobite here. Not a very good one, but I'll put that aside carefully on that bit of the rock. Um, yeah, graptolites, uh, no one really knows what they are unless you're a zoologist or a geologist, but they are a largely extinct group. They have some modern relatives called um, Rhabdopleura, which are very obscure and live in the under shells and sea, form little creeping colonies, and no one's ever really seen, most people have never seen one. Um, but the graptolites that 
we find most commonly here actually floated or swam that's a big controversy but they must have at least been able to move a little bit in the layers top layers of the sea and fed on plankton and they evolved very rapidly and they were very diverse for a lot of species so if you know which species you're looking at you can tell the age of the rocks very exactly so which is why we've got a very very good framework for understanding the ages of void and solarine rocks and being able to tell which rocks around the world are the same age, which is actually a really big thing. You know, if I'm looking at an event that happened here in Wales, did that happen at the same time as something in China or before or after? That's the sort of thing you're really interested in if you're trying to work out uh, how diversification patterns work, for example. So we, we're quite lucky here that we've got a reasonable assemblage of graptolites. We've got a thing called Didymograptus Marchisoni, named after Sir Roderick M.P. Marchison, who was the person who to define the Silurian system, so a very famous geologist. And they're a tuning fork shape, so they're shaped like that. Um, so very easy to identify. And we've got you know, thousands of them in this quarry. And that gives us the age quite well. But it, it's almost nice to have the age from more than one thing, just in case something survived a bit longer in one place or if you were a bit earlier in another place. So we've actually got a couple of other species. We've got another one called Proclimacograptus angustatus which is a very common and actually quite a long-ranging species. So that's not so useful, but it's consistent with having the Mergisone. And then we've got another species called Diplograptus foliaceus, which again is quite a well-known one. We've only got one specimen of it, but it's a very nice specimen. So we're sure that's what it is. Um, so we can pin the, the age down to the Diplograptus Mergisone zone of the Darawillian stage of the Ordovician system in fact, of the middle Ordovician. So we've actually pinned down the age very, very exactly. Um, it's actually somewhat more reliable than dating radiometrically by, by using something like potassium argon dating to get an exact age, because that's always got error bars on, and the error bars tend to be longer than the age of a graptolite biozone. But it's about 461, 462 million years-ish. Uh, so I think I'll get on to find some more graptolites. We have this sort of grand dream of being able to basically understand the built-in layer entirely. So it's on like 10 million year history. Um, there's 150 odd sites that we've got within walking distance of our house. And all of them are parts of a jigsaw. So what we want is to understand the whole picture eventually. So anytime we find a pile of rocks lying on the side of a hill, we stop and look because it's something new. It's uh, just a new bit of information and found loads of graptolites straight away and then a few little black blobs that look like they might be sponges and I like sponges so we took them away for the microscope, confirmed them and this was 2013 so, so eventually we found out where the spoil had come from which was this quarry we are currently standing in and we came back to collect more sponges because Joe likes sponges and kept finding more sponges um, um, got quite a good collection of sponges and then Covid happened and we were supposed to be going back to China, but that didn't happen. So we thought, well, we'll just get a few more sponges from here and write it up and do the paper. And yeah, so I just thought I'd have one more day in the field just to get the, the last few bits before I actually just finish the thing and, um, uh, and uh, write it up completely. And of course, um, that's the day when soft bodied fossils turn up. <laughs> so we've been working fairly randomly through the quarry, finding where the sponges were all the way through. And I was just trying to uh, pin down a few last little bits of the distribution of them. So working a little bit more systematically in one area, hence this, this little bit that we're working in now. And it turns out that the, uh, the, the exceptional fossils were not just in a tiny area or a tiny thickness of rock, but also in the blocks that we weren't bothering to split. Because the sponges tend to be on the surfaces, whereas all the soft-bodied stuff was inside them. So we've been coming here collecting for something like seven or eight years and had completely missed all the soft bodied really interesting things. Which is slightly embarrassing, but there we go. But then we found them, so we've done, I don't know, a few hundred days in the field perhaps over the next few years. Yeah, a couple of hundred, something so like that. So we've got a fairly good idea of what's where now. Yeah. And it turns out that the best exceptional preservation is in that little band there, but there's some in the higher beds and a bit in lower beds, so it is all the way through yeah. to an extent. Yeah, but um, the problem is we very rapidly discovered that these fossils are tiny, um, between one and three millimetres on average, and they have extremely fine detail, which our microscopes couldn't handle. Because we're living here not as academics in a university, but we're doing this largely as a hobby now. And so we had to actually get access to much better microscopes. And the only way we could think of doing that, which was suggestion of the landowner actually, 
was uh, crowdfunding. Yeah. So we thought that'll never work. And then we got 18,000 quid's worth and ended up with better microscopes than most universities. So we can study the fossils and publish them and let everyone know about them. Yeah. And um, we'll still keep going back out this summer and see what else we find because there might be something wonderful in the very next block. You never know. Yeah. I, I really want one of those spiky logopods. So do I.